Uh, you know, 10 years ago, I was on the Slovak seminar from this free society with Michael Novak, and a lot of those personalist ideals that we got mostly out of uh, Centesimus Annus and um, John Paul II became foundational, really hermeneutical principles for interpreting the ministry that came ahead in terms of encountering the per human person, the value of human work and dignity, kind of thinking about the various spheres of life. Um, and I think, unlike a lot of Protestant theology, I told this to John Henry, I said a lot of Protestant reflection on things is like Civil War reenacting. Like there was a big battle, there was something significant, and now people are just playing like they're still in that and it's over. So now the 20th century presented really cataclysmic issues that we had a very difficult time addressing. You know, what do you do with Auschwitz? What do you do with atomic war? What do you do with, you know, the communism? Uh, and really, the only people that seemed to be addressing these significant problems were the Catholics and integrating it into a world of faith. So instead of just presenting abstract theological issues like justification by grace, they were asking, what does it mean to be a human person marked by Christ in the world as we find it and as a person of hope? And so those, that, that exposure, that initial exposure was so foundational um, that when I saw this, it was like, okay, it would be nice to reconnect with that and in a new way because I wasn't familiar with Von Hildebrand. So to kind of come across someone uh, I was unfamiliar with and to be able to revisit this and it's been really uh, inspiring and affirming to sit through the lectures to reflect on what they mean and to think about um, sort of the next chapter of things. One of the things I'm impressed with with Buttiglione is his own personhood. I mean, he, you see him, he's operating not just as an academic philosopher, but as a person who's engaging reality on its deepest levels and really loving the world with his mind and also loving God with his mind. Uh, and so, I mean, even this afternoon when he was reflecting on the meaning of the internet or when we've talked about uh, the meaning of politics or how to be a Christian politician in the face of uh, people who aren't particularly interested in that. So I think really, uh, if you looked at the notes I've taken, Rocco's sections are the most complete in terms of copying down things he said, thoughts he's shared. I'm interested in Hildebrand because there are so few people who resisted the Nazis so completely. You know, like we've done projects in our parish with Holocaust survivors because we live in Los Angeles. We've invited Holocaust survivors to be with us and to speak about their experiences. We've talked about Father Maximilian Kolbe. I visited Auschwitz, I visited Mauthausen, I visited Buchenwald. I could list a whole Flossenburg where Bonhoeffer was hanged. And so we have this scar. And I said this to Bittiglione. I said, you know, I noticed in your article uh, a quote that you had from another philosopher. Has man, as a physical being, survived his spiritual extinction? because of Auschwitz, because of this thing that had this industrial death and murder of the human being. Uh, and so von Hildebrand was an interesting, bold, brave voice. And you know, as Protestants, we all have Bonhoeffer who decided to stay and who really wrestled with, should I participate in assassinating Hitler or not? And here's Hildebrand saying, I'm called to go so I can speak clearly about what's happening. Uh, and so I really appreciate that Hildebrand saw clearly and as Buttiglione said earlier today, which I thought was really an inspiring lecture, this idea of transcending the spirit of the time and that transcending of the spirit of the time is possible, and not to assume that you're just created by the time in which you live. So some of von Hildebrand's ideas I'm gonna be chewing on, uh, and especially because he was new to me, you know, it was really kind of an introductory and probably in many ways a superficial exposure to now have more time to let it percolate and think. Yeah, I think so. Actually, the two things that I'm interested in, um, you know, I'm the chair of a fairly large nonprofit in Southern California that works with adults with dis developmental disabilities. And one of, the, one of the programs we're working on right now is a kind of social entrepreneurship to create integrated employment for fully abled people and developmentally disabled people. And some of that's because of some complex legislation in California, also the federal government. But it's this idea of how do you look at work and the meaning of work and the dignity provided by work also for people who are disabled. And you know, it's almost like taking the model of L'Arche, which was community of abled and disabled, and now applying that to work. And so when you think about, uh, and that's one of the first things I ever learned from John Paul about work and the meaning of work and the dignity of work and human beings finding their calling and all of that. Um, and so as we've worked with disabled people, you see the same thing happening, but that the current environment in which that exists is threatened because of some shifting political will. Uh, so there's kind of a, a crisper, more clear commitment to figuring out how to make that work and really support personalist principles uh, so we can help people reach their full potential. And so actually there's a, a perfect wedding of the philosophy and the practical hope. And we're working with some pretty interesting corporate partners to have that happen. And the second thing is, and this was really a footnote in one of Michael Novak's lectures, uh, but it's really looking at the impact of humor. 
Yeah. And so I've been working with several groups in LA and now lots of friends. Um, and if you think about some of the, and this will be probably too obscure for the video, but I'm going to tell you anyhow. Uh, if you look at the way comedy's developed in LA and in Hollywood the last 30, 40 years, a lot of it has been wanting to get back to an, an essential experience of the human person. The whole heart of like the improvisation movement was instead of having like intellectually funny jokes where a person says, yeah, that's funny as an idea. No, we want to go deeper than that to almost an immediate unfiltered reaction of a human being rooted in emotion and relationship. So that in fact what's funny isn't the fact that I'm going to say something funny, it's the relationship we have and out of that comes a true honest moment of humor. And so there's been a desire among performers and entertainers to get to something true about human interaction, about human feeling, about human relationship that actually ties them perfectly with the philosophy of von Hildebrand and others. I mean, it almost seems like when, and I think particularly when said this, phenomenology as philosophy kind of returning to the self. Well, the comedians are trying to do the same thing. A human beings hungry for a kind of meaning that expresses, and, and it's funny. And, it's, and if you, if, and I've been working with the groundlings. So there's a few different schools. If you know like Will Ferrell, Phil Hartman, all those guys came out of the same school. A lot of Saturday Night Live people come out of that school. Uh, you know, you'll sit in a, a meeting with a director and the director says, all right, do the scene. It's like, that's not funny because you've thought it through too much that it's, not, it's artificial. So get rid of that and now just start doing something together. And in that encounter, some stuff, you'll be rolling on the floor laughing because of a behavior or a relationship. And it's something happening on a much more fundamental, visceral level uh, that creates art, a kind of art rooted in a human being just being human. So that's an interesting, you know, when he was talking about humor, and of course he was thinking from a political angle, there's actually an interesting sort of renaissance of the human being that it's making things funny. And so there's kind of that angle too, which is really kind of an unusual angle. But it's a good angle, so. I've, I've just been so delighted, like, you know, like you, people like you, uh, I've been really delighted with Rocco, like when he was talking about John Paul, you know, and then those personal sharing. I mean, there's a link of that generation of people who are gone now. You know, John Paul is gone. And now the people that knew him well, like Novak, are older. And then there's, so who, and then John Henry and I were talking about this a little bit last night. So who's behind them? Well, we're behind them. So now how does this, this legacy project become sort of entrusted to people? Uh, and I guess I'm, so when I talk about being older, I recognize that we're getting closer to the front line, if you will. It's one thing to kind of engage this on a philosophical level and put the notebook away. It's another thing to say, look, if we're not engaging this, no one will, because there's no one left to do it. You know, so there's a certain agency to the legacy that's been surprising. We went out to a local place. We encountered the people who were there. We didn't look down on them. I mean, we were dressed different than them. We're from very different experiences, but we just met them. Just listened to them a little bit. They listened to us. They shared their drinks. We drank their drinks. Uh, we drank more of their drinks. Uh, and so those moments of just sharing, storytelling, uh, and, and I guess I, I, what I'm thinking of, which is now I'm sort of rambling, but I'll say it this way, is when Buttiglione talked about John Paul II having friends and friends of friends and friends of friends of friends. Those relationships of friendship and those effective relationships are how things get done. So it's the same in the performing world. Like if I say, I want to make, uh, I want to do a show. Well, you can go to an open mic or you can go uh, do whatever and try and present yourself and no one cares because there's a thousand people doing the same thing. But if you make relationships with people, then you call your friend and you say, hey, you're doing a show. Like I'm going to do a show at the Hollywood Improv. And it's like, hey, I'm going to call my friend who does that show and say, hey, can you give me a spot in the show? Yeah, sure, I'll give you a spot. And so friendship becomes the mode by which people's careers are furthered, opportunities are made, and it's all through. You can try and do it the other way, but it doesn't really work. So friendship becomes the means by that actually happening, which is probably the same. The relationships that have come out of this will be the means by which things happen.